we doing beatings today? I didn't know we were doing beatings today. Beatings all day. Every day. This whole thing's messed up. We gotta go to police. And tell them what? Mom hired her uncle to kill a mobster who kidnapped dad? <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna work. Come on! Eli, you're living mom and dad's dream. Don't you ever want to do something for yourself? It's a bag of money! 50-50, okay? Don't be a wingless bird, Eli! Don't! What the hell is that? It's the Rune Star. Amir just bought it for $8 million. The big boss wants you and your brother to help us. You're gonna steal that, aren't you? If you do all this, she's gonna kill you. If you don't do all this, she's still going to kill you. Nick, she has my money! Listen to yourself, Eli! We're not criminals! It's too dangerous! Go! Loyalty, loyalty. No, don't! Your brothers never forget you have each other. Never. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Things I Do for Money. Cooped Up Creatives, welcome. Uh, uh, Cooped Up Creatives has been off the air. You can kind of see it over my shoulder here. We're on day 130 um, with the cast and crew of our movie, Things Are Do for Money. Uh, just want to go around. I have no idea where everybody is on the Zooms. Uh, but let's go around and introduce ourselves. Uh, so just introduce yourself, say your names, say a little bit of something about things to do for money, okay? So Max and Theo, you go first. All right, hello. My name is Max Aoki. Hi, I'm Fyodor Aoki. We both play the <laughs> brothers Yaguchi in the film Things I Do For Money. I'm Nick. And I'm Eli. And, uh, you know, in real life, we play the cello, we play together, we're brothers, we're from Hamilton. But this movie, Things I Do For Money, is also about two brothers who are also Japanese Canadian, play the cello, and they're from Hamilton. And just such a cool uh, crime caper that we got to be a part of. And this whole team got to meet them two years ago, and it's been crazy. It's been a crazy experience. And uh, yeah, we're excited that we're going to be showing y'all this tomorrow. How long did you practice that? That was perfect. That was great. That was a perfect introduction. We intentionally uh, practiced nothing. <laughs> uh, Yoda, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Yoda Teraderos. I play Lauren Mickle in Things I Do For Money. I'm basically their partner in crime. I'm a figure skater. I'm a heist organizer. And somehow I managed to do those things in real life besides all the crime stuff. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your first movie, first acting experience ever, right? First ever, yes. And you're fantastic in it. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go to my Japanese brothers in arms. Uh, maybe, Rhett, you can introduce yourself, sir. Hi, my name is Rhett Morita. I play Tasha Gucci in the film, the father of those two troublesome boys over there. Uh, it was also, as Warren said, my first film as well. So it's an incredible experience. Not your first film, my friend. Your first acting, acting starring film. role Correct. in a film. The you first time on the other movies. side of camera. That's yes, right. correct. Uh, Rhett, uh, a, a quiz question. Are you an award-winning world-class cinematographer as well? <laughs> Shh, keep it down, Warren. That's my secret job. That's my behind-the-scenes secret job. But right. yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, we were lucky to have you in front of the camera for this. Uh, ironically, we actually do have Max and Theo's father, uh, who plays their uncle uh, in a very bold casting choice. Ed, you want to introduce yourself, man? Hi, yes. Um, hi, I'm Ed Edward Aoki. I play just Jimmy. I play the uncle to uh, Eli and Nick, who are in real life actually my sons. Um, I don't know how I got the role, but I'm really grateful for it. It was uh, my first experience with anything to do with film, and it was a really terrifying one a lot of times. Uh, it's not too terrifying, because where do you actually work? You, you work in a military yeah, work school? I work at a, a military academy for uh, boys who uh, need a little more help. Right, just... and and uh, it's a, a little bit of a, a different side of you that we get to see in the movie in terms of you acting, but uh, you're a very creative soul, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Thank, and, you. Thank you, Warren. And mostly we needed a parent and guardian on set uh, as well uh, for Max and Theo, and uh, it, was, it was good to have you uh, there for that. Um, 
awesome experience. Uh, Colette, right across the pond, I'm going to go to you next, uh, just because I know it's, uh, it's very late in London, England, but uh, maybe if you can introduce yourself uh, to the world. <laughs> Hi, I'm Colette Zaka. I play Brenda, the wicked um, mobster. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's kind of about it. Well, it's not just about it because um, a lot of people in the UK will know you from a very famous um, <laughs> um, uh, campaign that's going on right now uh, for uh, Sloggy, uh, mm. where uh, you also play a, a, one of the fiercest grannies I've ever seen. But in this movie, you came all the way to Toronto or to Canada and to Hamilton yeah. uh, to play uh, Brenda. And we were really, really thrilled. Um, did you enjoy yourself when you were over here in Ontario? Oh, I had a blast. I loved it. <laughs> um, you can't, who can't love Brenda? I mean, she, she's the best kind of character to play because you can be everything in Brenda. You can be sweet, sweet old lady in a, in a wheelchair and, and all of these other things and then just be <sighs> at the back of it all. So what wasn't to love about that? and the crew and everybody else it was so lovely i really enjoyed my time very much uh well colette i just want you to know we sold out the drive-in theater tomorrow night in hamilton i want people going to the drive-in theater tomorrow night to clock colette's uh, voice uh, during this uh cooped up creatives because you're going to see a different side of colette and just jimmy as well so uh thank you colette for joining us um Dax Atilian, Dax Lowe, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Sure, Warren. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dax Lowe, and I play Alex Reduli, a bad guy in this. Alexi, uh, it's been too long. Yeah, Alexi. It's, it's, it's been too long since you. Uh, you Sorry, I, I must spoke. Uh, Alexi Reduli. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, it was a great experience. I can't say enough great things about Warren and the crew and uh, all of the other actors in this project. It was just so much fun. Uh, and I can't wait for everyone to see it. A uh, little bit of trivia, Dax and I started in music videos back in the late 90s uh, when we, uh, you would be my first AD and we right. would go out and, and shoot, you know, you know, two, three music videos a month. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun, but it's great to have you in front of the camera on Things to Do for Money. Um, uh, getting through this now, uh, Danilo, can you, uh, sir, smooth operator, introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your character Gonzo that you play. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Danilo Reyes. I played uh, Gonzo in the movie. Yeah, it was it was a really good experience playing Gonzo. He's uh, on the one hand part of this kind of evil crime family, but on the other hand, he's he's always trying to keep things in line. He's kind of the cool cat in the whole thing. So it was really fun, kind of playing that contrasting position with uh, with Dax with Alexi um, because we were side by side and we were partners in the film. And it was a really nice sort of uh, one-two sort of uh, ca counterpunch to each other, which was nice to see in the film. Um, yeah. Okay, Jennifer, we uh, I showed up at the Creative Theatre Company steps on Fennel uh, Avenue in Hamilton, Ontario, when I was like 16 or something. Yeah. And I, I walked into your studio and I said, what can I do? And ever since then, uh, I've been uh, trying to make a movie so that you could star in it. Uh, welcome. Can you can you introduce yourself to uh, the world here? Yeah, amazing. Uh, I'm Jennifer Walton, and I had the great honor of being in Warren's film. I got to play the mom, uh, Mary Yaguchi, who's you know just your average, normal, everyday mom trying to launder do the best money she can for her kids and her family, protect the family, laundering money. Yeah, a little bit of crime stuff, but you know you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> um, and you also uh, 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 ran a creative theater company in Hamilton, mm -hmm. and um, we did a audition boot camp. Um, it feels like ten years ago, but it was like yeah. the summer before we made Things to Do, which was now two years ago. That's and nice. you, you uh, many of your students came out to be in the film, right? That's right. There's a lot of our students uh, in various roles and backgrounds and, you know, making smaller appearances. And and even my niece is uh, my niece makes an appearance at the end as well. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it was great. And and of course, my business partner plays the, the teacher Claudette. as well. 
So, yes, yeah. um, okay. who will do a whole other Zoom with the Creative Theater, theater Company team uh, mm -hmm. after the movie is out on August 11th. So we do a little watch party with everybody. That'd oh, be fun. Uh, okay, now we're going to go into the crew side of things. Uh, my partner in crime, the co-writer, co-executive producer, uh, guy that found himself making a movie out of nothing and nowhere. Uh, Gary, uh, do you want to talk about who you are and how you came to this project? Sure. Uh, my name's Gary Nolan. Uh, I came to the project because I sort of introduced Warren to Max and Theo because I saw them at the school I work at. You, uh, um, you knew uh, Alicia, their mom, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I work with her mom. Um, and uh, right after I saw them, they, they performed at the school I teach at. And right after I saw them, I told Warren that he should do something with them. Like he was, I think you were still making videos at the time, Warren. I don't know if you were still making them, but you obviously made a ton of them. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to, to sort of showcase these guys. Do a little music and, uh, video or something with them. Yeah, and then Warren, uh, well, didn't you not phone them for two years? <laughs> I, I reached something. out to them. You told me to reach out to Max Theo, and I did within a couple months, which is pretty good for me. Right. Uh, they immediately responded, I think, within the hour. And then I ghosted them for about two years. Right. But Max and Theo, Gary and I did come back to you with an yeah. entire feature film script for you. Right. So. So, um, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, this, this whole things I do for money uh, concept, we've had, you and I have had it for forever. Um, and uh, we talked about it and, and thought that we'd like to do something with Max and Theo. And so we structured the storyline around two crime-based cello players and uh that's well, we've always loved crime movies we've always oh, loved yeah. the fargos the uh, uh old country no country for old men um uh, sort of the dark comedies um and gary and i uh, knew each other from the keg in hamilton we're ex-keggers um and i just felt bad that i had made 10 movies and gary and i had written about 20 scripts together but none of those movies were written by me and gary so i decided damn it, we're going to make a movie. And come hell or high water, next summer, this was like the summer of 2017 now, so the summer of 2018, we're going to make a movie. And then I immediately turned to my producer team, which I'm about to introduce, and said, let's do this. Um, I'm going to first go to Abby Fettigreen because he has a fish right beside him. And I'm just wondering, what, what can that be right there, sir? Oh, you uh, have to, uh, turn off your mutes. You got the first Mutie Award. You have to turn off your little microphone there, man. What is that? This is the best, uh, I think the, uh, it's a special jury prize for things I do for money at the Bayou Film Festival. In Cinema Louisiana. on the Bayou, Louisiana, right. Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, where uh, Gary, um, Max and Theo and Warren and I went in January pre-COVID to have some Cajun and um, some awesome Louisiana music and uh, show our film to the lovely people there. And uh, we walked away with a fish. <laughs> can you hold up the bass just so uh, everybody can see it? This is, um, so really, this is the first time this entire cast of crews had a chance to have basically a reunion. Um, um, uh, some of you were able to come out to uh, Whistler but um, um, not many of you were able to get, get down to Louisiana with this. And this is, the, this is your award. So uh, everybody can just kind of grab it and take it with them if they, if they want. Uh, uh, Abby, just uh, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit as the, uh, one of the four amazing producers of Things I Do For Money? Uh, Abby Fettigreen, producer, distributor, director. Yes, director now. Uh, cheap bottle washer. A uh, big fan of uh, the other producers on this show, uh, Jen Pogue, Emily Andrews, and Laura Norton. I forever live in their shadows. Um, I've been bugging Warren forever to make a film, and I'm grateful that I got an opportunity to be involved in this one, and I'm super proud of it. And to be able to work with this talented group of cast and, and crew, uh, when you all see it, it'll blow your minds. Um, well, let's go to Film Coop now, who was sort of the uh, producing genius, geniuses on the floor in Hamilton. Uh, let's go to let's go to Laura, Mama Laura, and Oslo first, just for the introductions, because you have such a beautiful baby, and this is new since we made the movie, right? Yes, this is new since <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, <laughs> she was not on set. <laughs> uh, I'm Laura Norton and I'm part of Film Coop. And uh, this was just a blast to, to be part of. Um, I've never made a heist movie and um, it was really, uh, well, it was just a lot of fun. Um, and also your uh, expertise as an actor really helped Max and Theo. Uh, Max, what's, Max and Theo, what was it like learning, uh, getting a crash course in acting from Laura Norton, the acting teacher? <laughs> oh, that was amazing. We came down to uh, Toronto, I guess two summers ago, just before we filmed. And uh, Laura took us through all of the, you know, miser techniques. You're all tested now, do you remember? Acting, yeah. acting techniques and, you know, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of like scene rehearsal. Um, and she was, she was amazing. It was really, really helpful for us. Laura, uh, straight goods. When Max and Theo showed up, were you scared when you first were like, these are the two stars of her movie and they never acted before in their lives. What, what was going through your mind when they came in for acting lessons? I wasn't scared. I, I, I knew why you had chosen to like basically write this whole thing around them. They're wonderful people, number one. And then, and then they're extremely talented. And so it was a lot of fun, actually. There was, I wasn't worried. <laughs> Do you remember one lesson that in, your, in particular in your mind that they uh, uh, either nailed or did not do well? In? No, no. Uh, one of them where I, I was actually quite, you know, I was surprised that they were able to go so deep emotionally. I thought that was really, really interesting, especially with a complete stranger. Right. They'd never met me before. And so, um, you know, they're in my living room <laughs> and, uh, and we were doing uh, the scene. I, I think it's like where they, uh, uh, who ties one of the other tie or something and it was yes just, the tie scene yeah it was really moving and I remember we stopped and I, I was like wow guys and they were like really <laughs> it was okay <laughs> what do we do <laughs> how do we do that again yeah <laughs> well yeah. thank you for getting them ready because uh, uh, we'll, we'll see at the drive-in theater the handiwork that uh, the three of you came up with uh, a couple weeks before we went to camera your partner in crime in this heist movie is Emily Emily would you like to introduce yourself as well hi my name is Emily Andrews, and I am one of the producers on this film, and I'm very proud to say it loud and proud and live. Um, <laughs> it was fantastic. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better time. We, we lived together. We breathed together. We created together. This is pre-COVID, so it was okay to do Yeah, it was okay. Things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was just such an exciting time. From the moment we said we're doing it and we pressed go, it was just all hands on deck and a collaborative effort and every person went above and beyond on set and off set everywhere. It was, it was a very positive experience and you can't say that for every film. You can't, I mean, you can like your projects, but I loved doing this with all of you. Uh, yeah. Well, and it was intense, right? It was like a 13 day main unit shoot two pickup days where uh, I'm about to get to Christoph Benfi, who looks like he's been through a prize fight. But um, uh, just, just while we have you, Emily and Laura, your company, Film Coop, um, this is not the first feature you have. You've, you've made many films together. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about Film Coop? And when this project came to you, um, it, 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 it didn't really fit a lot of the things that you were doing, but, um, you know, what, what drew you to coming on board with it? Uh, well, I mean, there are many draws to it. And often when we're looking at different projects, I would say that, you know, there's lots of factors that lead to us making a decision about being involved. Um, but the script was great and fun. And I loved the mixing of genres, personally. Um, I mean, Warren, you're a legend. So we are excited to be able to work with you. And um, yeah, I also love the, the, the idea of being in Hamilton and um, shooting it for Hamilton. You know, that's pretty, that's not really done often. And so that's some of the things that excited us to come on board. And, and we had, I feel like we've been working with Jen for, forever, but you know, it was a recent partnership with Jen Pogue um and then this was going to be the first film for film coop with jen yeah uh, in, yeah in the so, producer circle yeah like the first feature obviously yeah together with jen 
nice uh, segue to uh, Jen Pogue, who uh, is uh, waiting patiently for her turn. Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Jen. I made the coffee and did some paperwork <laughs> and uh, terrorized the director whenever possible on things <laughs> I do for money. <laughs> for those that don't know, Jen yeah. and I have been uh, wonderfully married. We, we, we just got married. Ring power. Yes. Um, yeah, things I do for money was our test to see if we wanted to get married or yes. not afterwards. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And now you so want to get divorced. Nothing could be, yeah, nothing could be harder than that. So, uh, and we got married in, in October, uh, and we just uh, we, our hearts go out to the couples that want to get married right now during uh, the, the protocols. But um, uh, part of the celebration of things I do for money is also um, the the work that we did get to together. Jen, do you want to say anything else about your <laughs> way to bring it down? One. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was my first feature that I've ever been involved in. Had I known what I was getting myself into with like no money and no time to make a feature of this extreme, <laughs> extremeness, um, you know, it's probably good that I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but, uh, we did it and I could not be prouder of it. And of you, Warren, I know you worked, uh, night and day night and day for years now um, for this film. So I'm very, very proud of you and of it. You know, because I just won't come to bed sometimes. So. It's true. Um, our, we got a lot of shout outs on the uh, Facebook for East Van. Hey, Anna Catley, can you introduce yourself uh, to your fans out there? Um, hi, I'm Anna Catley. I was the editor for Things to Do for Money. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, your mom, you know, I'm not going to shout her out, but Rebecca, hey. But uh, Keisha Rose uh, says, hi, Anna. And uh, you got Aww. a lot going on right now. So. Uh, hi, Keisha. Hi, Mom. Hi, East fan. Um, yeah, I was the editor. Um, since we're all talking about first, it's also my first feature that I edited, um, which I am super happy about. I think it was an amazing first feature. This movie literally has everything. I shoot out comedy, family drama. So um, it was awesome. And it was so great to work with Warren on it. And I'm so happy I got to do it. Uh, if it was, if this, if things I do for money was your first feature, put up your hand. Let's, let's just see first feature film. Boom. I'm going to take a little screenshot of this. Wow. Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, oh, wait, one more time. One, two, three. First feature club. Boom. Done. Uh, Anna uh, won't be your last feature. In fact, what are you working on right now uh, um, that, that you can talk about NDA wise? That I can talk about. Um, I just wrapped up uh, editing a web series called Avocado Toast, yes. which is on Out TV and Amazon Prime. Um, and just kind of wrapping up a few other projects before I start something in September. The wonderful thing is it's your first feature and you haven't stopped working since. So uh, hopefully uh, we can afford you for the next feature. Um, Definitely. There's something that happens in the Cat Weber School of Editing where I just can't <laughs> afford the editors anymore. So uh, talking about first features um, from the main title fights, Christoph Benfi, uh, <laughs> the DOP. Would you like to introduce yourself? Can you get a little close up of your face there, sir? Sure. Tell Seven us what happened there. Your... Oh, man. Yeah. That one, a few makeup artists have asked me for like daily photo updates of what it looks like so they can recreate it if they ever yes, need to. Yes, right. What <laughs> happened? Um, yeah. What happened to you, man? Tell, tell the, the world. Concrete. I hate the, the concrete. concrete. I won't go into more detail than that. Okay. All <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Trying to get um, the perfect shot, I imagine. I want to be still insurable, and I'm worried if I go into too much detail, I'll get I drunk, understand. But... <laughs> I understand. No, it was fantastic uh, to have you on Things I Do for Money. Uh, your first feature, what went through your head when. Um, when I asked you to do the impossible. I think I was a little nervous about how eager you were. Like, I think you were excited when I told you it was my first feature and that you knew that you probably wouldn't be able to do something like this with a seasoned DP that would just have all these expectations. So, which I am now a seasoned DP. I've shot a whole three features now, but uh, no, it was, it was like- You've shot like three features? Since Things I Do For Money, you've shot another two, two features? Two since, yeah. Whoa, Yeah. that's fantastic. I mean, it's been it's been almost two years now. Surprise! With who? Yeah. With yeah. who? <laughs> With Abby Fettergreen. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> um, yeah, Abby's been bringing me along, taking me under his wing ever since. But yeah, no, this was my first feature, and it was just a wild ride. I don't think we could have pulled it off without every single person who was there. 
on the crew, like on the crew side of things, like the people who are working under me in the grip and lighting and camera departments, but then also with you as the leader, kind of, you know, always uh, like running around and picking up C stands and just like helping to move the ship forward. So it was an honor to work with you. And yeah, and I don't think we could have done it without the the dynamic of the crew that we had. Cause it was, a, it was a crazy 13 days. <laughs> well, and the yeah. two days that you and I ran around Hamilton trying to get establishing yeah. shots and everything. Uh, yeah, well, your crew, I mean, everybody from uh, Nick Coffin to uh, mm -hmm. everybody on camera grip and lighting, um, mm -hmm. just really uh, Joe Crave, first AD, everybody, um, uh, Lindsay wrote the um, uh, production designer, um, everybody mm -hmm. just brought their, AD. Up their socks <laughs> and, and um, you know, um, it, it, it's one thing to go into a production um, knowing that, uh, uh, you know, everyone's done it before. But I think the beauty of this was a lot of us haven't done it before. And the ones that had didn't know how everyone was going to react. But um, I, I would like to just kind of open it up uh, to the floor. Does everybody remember their first day on set? Um, and maybe we'll go for the actors first. Let's uh, let's let's ask Max and Theo about your first day on the set of Things I Do for Money. Do you remember anything memorable? The first day, right? Yeah, the, the first day. I remember what, we woke up at like five to to get it on set on time. And then it was like me and Yoda running down alleyways, slipping on gravel and shoes that were a little too big for me. And <laughs> it's super hot. I mean, it was really uncomfortable. I remember that. It was like <laughs> I did, did like five different scenes that day. I um, told John Dunnett, the costume designer. Make sure Theo's the most uncomfortable actor. <laughs> that's who Eli should be. And John came through for us. Well, yeah, I think I think it worked out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was it was super hectic, but it was an eye-opening experience. It was super cool to see. What about you, uh, Max? Uh, your first day on a film set. I, I remember my first day on the film set was one where um, we have a scene together, and it's um it's a it's a walking scene. I guess I'm not going to get too too much into the depth of the plot there, but uh, it was so 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 crazy different to like. Cause I know like, cause we've been doing really, really small scale kind of music videos ourselves just for fun. Like with an iPhone. Check out and, Versicello on YouTube and yeah, all the Max yeah, and video, uh, videos are there. Go follow them. It's fantastic. But then all of a sudden, you know, you have a director, a bunch of producers, uh, uh, people are like making sure you're not sweating too much. And, and then cameras are rolling and they're huge. Um, and I even remember like my first full day on set being in the, uh, um, in a, in a, in more of a bar scene. Right. And, uh, At this ain't Hollywood. Uh, at this which, in Hollywood, yeah, amazing, which, amazing which unfortunately movie. has closed now. So, uh, a tip our hats to this in Hollywood, and it was a wonderful uh, location to shoot in. Um, but did did was it weird for you? You 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 both been sort of on tour. You you played performances. You you've been around the entertainment industry. What was different about your first day on set? Oh, uh, it's different having a bunch of cameras on you, and you know that when you're going for that take you're either you get it or we're going to be spending a lot more time than necessary in one day. It's already jam, jam packed. So okay. stressful, but amazing. Uh, Yoda, your first day on set. And in fact, maybe back it up a little bit in terms of, um, do you remember getting the casting call for things that need for money? Like it was yesterday. Do you remember what, like, can you tell me a little bit about what you thought when you saw it and describe what the casting call was? Um, for the casting call, I remember just receiving an email asking for skaters in the area and specifically African like skaters. And I was like, black okay, skater. I'm yeah. Up, like, <laughs> I will be there. And yeah, then once I sent in my video, got a call back. Uh, I remember immediately after my in-person audition, Warren and everyone was just like, okay, you got it. And I couldn't even believe it. I was waiting for the cameras to come out and be like, okay, psych, prank. No, <laughs> like next person actually got it. Like, don't worry. But yeah, like it was an amazing experience. I couldn't believe that my first audition ever, my first feature ever. I, I remember what you told me uh, because uh, we wrote uh, Laura uh, in, in the film specifically um, because um, we wanted the grace of figure skaters, you know, I, Gary, you can, you can chime in whenever you want in terms of like, we were looking for a counterpoint to all the action, but do you remember what you said to me, uh, Yoda, about uh, finding a black figure skater, especially? 
you you basically said, Warren, if you didn't find me, you weren't going to, I'm, I'm the one. <laughs> and we were so that. lucky um, uh, that you, you came in. It, so do you remember um, your first day on set? I do remember my first day on set. It was the alley scene with Theo. And I just remember no matter how early it was, the sun and the sweat and just the patience of you, everyone with sound, makeup, hair, everyone was just like making me feel so comfortable. That's, I think what I remembered the most was just like how patient everyone was with me. Um, Colette, uh, you flew in and, um, we're kind of thrown in the deep end. We had a couple of days of rehearsal, which was great. But do you remember that that day on set, uh, that first day on set that you had? I believe it was at the auto shop, right? No. Oh. I think the first. I think the first one was in the car. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and and then uh, we probably did the bingo scene, maybe. No, then the auto I show. No, I, can't, oh. I can't. I can't remember. Okay, so uh, what, you tell me what your first day on set was like, because I completely <laughs> forget. So, well, my first day, I I was aware of the time scale. Right. I was aware that everything was being cracked. You know, so for me, it was just just remember your lines. You've come all this way. Don't mess up. Just remember your lines. So and and. And so I was just that focused on it and sort of just feeling my way because I was with, I was with people I didn't, you know, it wasn't like we'd done a rehearsal, normal filming rehearsal, we'd gone in. I'd met the boys and I'd met Yodit, but I hadn't met anybody else. And so it was a little bit like, ooh, you know, a little bit treading water, but it didn't, it didn't last for long. And then it was, you know, and then everybody was just friends and, and it was, could just get on with the job. Um, well, the, the highlight for me was your performance in the bingo scene. Um, <laughs> you had the most patience uh, and people uh, going to the drive-in tomorrow night will uh, see this sort of, it's the center point scene. It happens kind of in the middle of the film. And uh, it's a tour de force uh, of, of uh, Colette as Brenda trying to rule the roost uh, in Hamilton's underworld. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, Rhett and Ed, I'm not gonna ask you about your first day. I'm gonna ask you about the Japanese scene. Uh, and if both of you can kind of just talk about it uh, and riff off each other, um, to put it in context, um, so, uh, Ed and Rhett and myself are uh, what we call, uh, we're all sensei, right? We're all uh, third generation uh, Japanese Canadians. That's we, right. don't play, we, we, don't, we don't speak Japanese. <laughs> you know, like uh, the, the sensei um, kind of uh, uh, were assimilated as quick as possible into uh, the Canadian culture. So, you know, I don't know about your family, but so, so I didn't get bullied and I didn't get beat up. And I certainly wasn't taught how to speak Japanese uh, because I, I, you know, I was I was trying to be Canadian at the time. So when you were offered this role and you're flipping through the pages of the script and then you see a, a scene and it says, "Oh, this will be in Japanese." What went through your mind, uh, Rhett and Ed? Rhett, Rhett, maybe you first. Okay. Well, I did mention this at the uh, Whistler Film Festival because it was the one most scary, momentous event in the entire film for me was the Japanese scene that I would do with Ed. Being a non-speaking Japanese per person who looks Japanese, trying to fake my Japanese, even though I'd had about four weeks of, three weeks of training of trying to learn this scene phonetically because I didn't understand 90% of the words. So I know for myself, Ed, I don't think we've talked much about this, that that was the most confrontational scary moment ever in my entire life was trying to do, get through a scene speaking a language that I only have heard maybe, I said, maybe 10% of those words even before spoken. I don't want to add anything, Ed, definitely. Yeah, because like uh, when I grew up, I, I, I heard Japanese around me. My parents were talking about me. I didn't know what they were talking about. But our parents don't know perfect Japanese. I think that's what everybody needs to know. They, they you know, my parents spoke a BC slang of Japanese where yep. they they would, they would bring in sort of Hokushin words and make them, and you know, there's this one word that they kept saying when the boys 
um, acted up, they would go, Yoshoharu, Yoshoharu. And I think that just means, oh, you're acting up. What I found out is it was Yoshi Haru, and it was this kid who used to act up, and then they used that as the the verb of acting up. So, like <laughs> my conception of Japanese is all kind of fucked up. So I know, uh, but when I saw the script and I saw the Japanese, and then I thought, okay, you no, know, this, this could be possible. Like I am Japanese, uh, but then then being introduced to Alina, Alina Miyaki. Yes. And when I say it was terrifying, she was the terrifying part, right? Because like being like on the on Skype and having the coaching done and she could hear things that I just could not hear. Yes. Uh, but she took me through it. She was fantastic. Uh, and, uh, and Rhett, you had uh, Hidetaka, right? As your yes, uh, uh, coach. Yeah. And then yes. uh, Young uh, came in at the end to uh, uh, to help out as well. But yeah, Ed, what was it like, man? Uh, it, it was, it was, it was. One, you're saying something, I'm saying something to Rhett, and I'm angry, uh, but I don't know what I'm saying, right? I, I have an idea what I'm saying, but I don't know what the, which the words are, or what I'm saying. And I'm trying to read his reactions as well, too. Uh, so it, was, it was interesting. It was, it was like, made me, made me want to study Japanese. I'm like, gee, maybe I should study Japanese. Uh, great, great experience, terrifying experience, and, but I had great coaches, fantastic coaches to go through this through. Uh, it is, uh, it's a daunting thing for professional actors, for veteran actors to learn an entirely new language, but for, uh, for Rhett and Ed, who had never starred in a movie, uh, Ed, you've never acted before in your life, to do that, uh, thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Um, uh, something that I wanted to ask uh, Dax and Danilo, your scenes are all together usually, um, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff happening between uh, uh, Gonzo and Alexi throughout the film. What was, did you, did you guys work on your own uh, rehearsing at all um, to, to get into it? Or uh, what was the process for both of you? Dax, why don't you go first? <laughs> well, I was, I was just waiting to see if you jumped in, but thank you, Danilo. Um, I think that rapport, Warren, um, that Danilo and I had from the get-go when we would have some of the pre-rehearsals at your house, uh, really established a good little, um, just open friendship uh, for us. And, and, and since then we've become friends and I think that translates on screen. Uh, it was really great working with Danilo. He's uh, really understated and just there, really supportive and all of the physical stuff that we had to do in the film, uh, you'll see when you watch it, but uh, Danilo was just amazing to work with in that regard. What was it like Danilo? Yeah, I mean, similar sentiments. It's um, we didn't, other than the rehearsals that we had with you, we didn't, we didn't necessarily work on things outside of that. And I think we just we just um, let the moments happen when we were together. And there and there was there was a rapport, you know. And and um, during the shoot and even and even afterwards, um, I learned a lot from Dax. And he's um, you know just has a lot of knowledge about about film and acting and um, I'm, I'm thankful for the help that he gave me in that in that sense. So yeah, it was a great Likewise. experience. Yeah. Likewise, brother. Uh, I can't wait for the drive-in audience to see uh, your relationship in the movie uh, progress throughout um, <laughs> uh, and, and have a, a, a wonderful moment, uh, an, an unfortunate moment. Um, okay, so mom, Jennifer Walton, um, you have uh, been able to, uh, uh, come on board uh, this uh, feature film shoot, and mm -hmm. um, when you you got onto set, what was what was your first day on set like? Uh, I remember uh, driving like a maniac uh, around the cotton factory, uh, and uh, I think you wanted maximum speed and some tire squealing, and so <laughs> I think that was maybe the first thing I shot that day. And I thought, oh, this is going to be such a wild ride, and you know. <laughs> It was both literally and figuratively. It now, was... for the people at home, it was safe. It was completely controlled. You weren't oh, yeah. in the middle of traffic, but you were able to. Uh, you were able to. There was like, no traffic. Yeah, but you. You know, it, it was a sense of play that I felt uh, both you and Claudette uh, were able to have. Um, do you re uh, do you remember what was the hardest scene for you to shoot? Um, I think the. The hardest scene was um, at the hotel, and I think it was just, it was physical. I, by the end of it, I was covered in, in some bruises, just because you know it was all in, and it was 
it was it was a really it's a really dramatic scene. Um, there's a lot of emotion there. Uh, it's uh, intense, uh, high drama, and also uh, pretty exciting. I don't want to give anything away because right. it's such a great scene. But uh, that was that was I felt like that was my my very big day on set. So is it is it different than theater? Did you find it? Just different, a different set of muscles. Yeah, or or? for sure. I, I think you know, theater is so uh, external, and so the trick is always to to bring it in and, and do the thinking, and which is enough, you know, as opposed to the emoting outward. So I know, as a theater actor, for me, it's always about checking that, you know, and making sure that it's not too much, not too much, you know. Um, well, I I can't wait for uh, people to see it. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, because Christoph. We might lose you at any moment. I know you're on your data plan. I'm asking the actors to maybe turn off their cameras and let the crew take center stage right now uh, because uh, this hardworking uh, team rarely gets um, the accolades that they deserve. But um, here I am with my uh, producers, uh, my co-writer, uh, the cinematographer and editor. Um, and can we can we just talk a little bit about uh, the process of uh, making it. Um, let's talk Jen, Emily, and Laura, the actual physical making of the film, because uh, you were there in a combination of film coupe every day on set. So what was that like? And don't, you don't have to be, you know, yeah. you don't have to be nice. Like there are filmmakers watching this and it would be great to tell them yeah, I mean, we had a lot of challenges that, that went into it. We had a lot of set shifts, you know, and pretty much every day we, we we rarely stayed at one location. So that was like, get her done, getting out of there and moving it. Um, some of my funny and fond memories are like our production office was wherever it could be. One time it was in a bathroom. One time <laughs> it was in the furnace room. Um, yeah, so you're just kind of shifting that way. And the furnace room was a luxury. It had a door on it. That's true. Yeah. Ooh, it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other thoughts come to mind for you in uh, making it, Jen or Laura? Laura, do you, uh, do you have a, a, a particular, I, I, I don't know if Oslo is completely asleep and you can speak or not. Sleep. It's fine. Um, oh, man. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I just remember it. it I always felt like I was in a tornado. <laughs> like, I always felt like, okay, there's this that's happening. It's going well. So now I have to go over here and make sure that we're going to get ahead in the next uh, location. Um, you know, dealing with craft services and, and food and, and catering and um, just making sure all the gear could get from place to place and people could get from place to place. I just remember feeling just like, <sighs> And the changeover from Kelly Carney to Josh Airy on locations, because uh, we had yeah. 35 locations. Yeah, I would say you nailed that M and Laura with with that, like like the location shifts, we average three locations a day. And if anybody's made a film, you know that that's nuts, like that's nuts. Um, so it's just constant motion, constant trying to get what we needed to get so we could move on to the next thing so we could get our day in a regular time frame mm -hmm. is... and basically we broke like every indie film rule you know mm -hmm. of like one location four yeah hours, you know, just take yeah. it easy on your first yeah. step also warren was very specific with his request for uh production cars like vehicles picture vehicles that we had so like all of a sudden one day you'd be like i need a red smart car <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i remember that day I and, it, and, and it didn't even make the movie and laura found it yeah <laughs> and it didn't even make the cut of the movie warren yeah <laughs> well yeah. coming off of those tier a dgc uh episodic tv shows uh, as a director you kind of get yeah. used to you know yeah, you uh, get used to getting what you want that's they it. don't uh, just come out of <laughs> air well the 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 really great thing was uh i think emily you, you really summed it up it was an intense shoot we did not have a lot of time we were doing uh 11 plus one basically 12 hour days with a one hour of lunch doing three set shifts. I mean, we, we would be doing sometimes 12 pages a day with, with oh 
fight scenes and you know cello performances and skating scenes so and guns um, blood like yeah. yeah and and then we'd go home and and make the call sheets and print all the sides for the following day so it was it was non-stop we needed we needed 40 hours in a day to make this yeah. we didn't have that so we just uh well i'm i'm moving my way through uh let's let's go to gary and just talk about uh the original idea of doing something very small and contained one or two locations and like a three or four person cast. What, what, what happened to that little idea that um, everybody was telling us to do? Uh, we're not good at that. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it kept, every time we would come up with an idea, we, we didn't reject it just because we should have. We, we said, no, this is a good story point. We should do this. And, and then before we knew it, we had, you know, the movie we had, which was a lot bigger than, than anyone well, Emily in particular, I recall, was, was saying, no, you can't do that. No, we can't do that. We can't be on this roof. And it's like, oh no. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it was great. I mean, in, in terms of what was accomplished, I, I think it was spectacular, but. Uh, I think we had a conversation early on. You, you flew out to Halifax when I was doing this hour's 22 minutes yeah. and we did like a, two weeks, uh, like a week and a half or two weeks of writing on this. And we, we kind of tried to start really small, like maybe a horror film or something, you know, in, in one house or whatever. And I think we started really early on saying, we got to do better. We got to push, if we're going to use our own money, use our own time, you, you know, uh, use all the favors we have in the world, let's swing for the fences. And, I, yeah, and that we, really resonated with me, you know? I think we, um, we really wanted to showcase what we could do. And, and if we had, you know, four actors in a haunted house, it, it was just too limiting for what we really want to do. Plus, um, from what I recall, we always want to write things that we want to see and, and that we think are fun. And not yeah. say I don't enjoy horror films, I do, but they're just not as fun as this movie. Like, this well, we, we always wanted to capture right. Hamilton the way yeah. we know it, oh, right? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you yes. live downtown West End, but like we know the East End. Right. Uh, I know the mountain. I know the divide sometimes that occurs. Uh, and we wanted to use that metaphor uh, in the film. Uh, yeah, the line characters. crossing and stuff. <laughs> Can I say something? Yes, Jen, of course. Um, I wanted to shout out Hamilton because, I mean, we're all this talk about locations, like we couldn't have done it had we not done it in Hamilton. And I don't think it's any secret that Hamilton's a great place to shoot anymore, unfortunately. I feel like we were uh, one of the first, but, and like, because you guys knew it so well, the ins and the out and Kristoff knew it so well. It was, it was a dream. It was a dream location. Yeah, it made We it. got everything we wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I found it pretty interesting that we would write things and then uh, sort of almost not knowing that we were writing a specific location and would come across and go yeah it was this place this is it this is where we're filming like the uh the end scenes where the way it unfolded i mean people who come see the film will understand what i'm talking about but it you couldn't have come up with that better than we did in terms of the way it, it is actual real like you could actually have done what we did at the end of the movie as as real in terms of the location which i think is pretty interesting um, it, it certainly becomes a character in the, and that's what we kind of wanted as we were writing it. Um, Jen just threw down to Christoph. Christoph, you have a fan club happening out there in, in Facebook world as well. Our wonderful friend Florence says you're a gem. Uh, and, um, uh, also, uh, uh, Harpreet and Andrew shout out to Max and Theo. There's some talented leads there. Um, Rebecca Catley, Anna, your mom asks if she can buy the soundtrack. It's coming. Uh, Abby's doing some work right now. He's prepping three movies. So I'm going to go to Christoph next. So Abby, you keep working on your spreadsheets there. Uh, but uh, Christoph, you have a lot of people hopefully uh, hoping that you, uh, you, you get better, but uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the shooting of the film because um, it was, it was intense. Can you, can you, for the, for the filmmakers and for some of the emerging cinematographers out there, what was the process of getting ready and shooting something like things to do for money? Oh, was, no. oh there, there you go. I got you. I got you. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty wild. And going back to uh, what Laura said about it being a tornado, but like really that's kind of, I love working in that environment. So it was, it was, I mean, it was insane and it was a lot of stress for sure, but it was, it was also a lot of fun and um, it made us use our time really well. I thought um, 
but like I remember because obviously it was my first feature but not my first film like I did a lot of short films and we used to do these award-winning award-winning short films Chesterfield is one of my favorite films ever and uh you created uh and and that's why how I met met, uh, Jake who's in the film uh in the this ain't Hollywood scene uh because I loved your movie uh that was kind of the movie that's like I want to work with Christoph a really fun movie too um but we've we've been often been criticized like the people that i like to make movies with on making movies that shouldn't be you know like everyone's always like oh just pick one location and just you know do a scene study kind of thing for a short film but we're always like no we should have like the bank robbery and then they go to the security footage and then you know like the car chase and so i, I just like love working in that environment and this movie was just that to a t for 13 days straight being I think it was at least two locations a day. So it would be like show up to a location, you know, basically pre-light, but then start shooting and then, you know, pack up and go to the next location. And we were doing, we were doing two unit moves every single day. Uh, and big really scenes, came... just big scenes, like yeah. two, six like, page, so... seven page scenes. And shout out to the talent on camera, because I think, you only notice these things when they're not doing a good job. But when you're when you're moving so fast and you only have so much time to to capture stuff like that, the fact that everyone nailed their parts, like basically, I mean, aside from one particular scene, but for the most part, everybody really nailed it in the first on the first take. Like we, I think we did like maybe two or three takes at the most every time, and and the actors all. Knew well, we do two or three takes and then move on to my fifth angle of coverage that I wanted. <laughs> we're never waiting on talent. We were like, it was, I think it was just work like a really well oiled machine across the whole spectrum. Any, yeah. any ticks, uh, trips, uh, sorry, tips or tricks that you learned shooting a feature that you want to pass on from a cinematographer's uh, uh, viewpoint? Working with you because um, I'm really fortunate to have worked with people like Nick and Andrew and other people who are in my team and we have really good chemistry and they almost know what I'm thinking without me even saying it so like a lot of times I'll be thinking okay I want to switch to a 35 and I'll turn around and Nick's holding it there and like you only get that from working together with people a lot and in the case of indie stuff that means you know doing short films and and fun projects together as a group and the more you do that the more you kind of like know what each other are thinking and the less time you spend trying to explain stuff to people because in an indie in an indie movie world you just don't have time for that you have to be moving quick skills so um having a really good crew that you work well to, well with is like is super key and then also prepared so um, yeah you can and, have less crew if you if you work well with them than more crew and you, it's 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 more chaotic right so many different people um so in this case it worked well to our advantage that it was a small but mighty crew uh, and then like i said being prepared um you don't want to show up to a location and start thinking about how you're going to light it when you're on this kind of a thing. Like you kind of, that's why you do your location scout and your tech scout and you have a plan in mind and you've already communicated that to your gaffer and your, you know, camera team. So that as soon as it, that you show up, like stuff starts happening and you can just be focusing on what you need to do. So being- or, or those surprises come up where, you know, we actually had a tie shop. We had a, a men's dress shop in Hamilton all lined up to shoot in. And like the day before we were supposed to shoot it, the location dropped out um, and we ended up shooting it in the house. And it's one of my favorite scenes just because visually the, there's a, there's the, the dark door of Max coming out and the white door of Theo coming out. And like it, all the symbolism came out of this one moment, but, but we found that on the day, right? We're like, shit, I guess we're shooting the scene here at the house now. Yeah, that is a great scene. Something falls through. Yeah. You just got to be able to roll with the punches and adapt quickly and make decisions really quickly. All right, I, I'm going to throw uh, from the footage that Christoph shot to the editing prowess of Anna Catley. Um, can you tell uh, some of the filmmakers watching this about, uh, you know, how do you like how much footage did you get? How did you organize it? And how did you uh, get into the cut of things you did for money? Oh, um, how did I org? Uh, well, I organized it all by uh on sequences basically i'm a timeline editor so and it was two camera setup so i had stacked uh takes um on all my timelines and basically once i kind of organized everything and kind of gone through and you know marked the takes i liked best 
it was basically just assembling scene by scene and little sequences and then gradually they would kind of morph together and I would add one scene to another another and then eventually I just had like you know five really long assemblies which became the movie but it was basically just kind of globbing scenes onto other scenes until it all kind of came together. And what was your thoughts going like because you were in Toronto while we were shooting and we would yeah uh, I mean Christoph would literally stay up all night transferring the drives over which is not usually what the director of photography does but you know you want the job done right you you, you sometimes have to do it yourself <laughs> you would get this footage what was going through your mind in terms of like did you know what you were going to get in terms of cutting no uh <laughs> i mean i'd read the script and i knew it was going to be kind of bananas but it, when it was all in front of you it, it truly is kind of it was it was a lot i guess you guys like you were talking about you're constantly kind of shooting and moving from location to location so there wasn't Obviously there was, you know, slating happening and happening and all of that, but like more often than not, you just keep rolling and resetting and things like that. And it resulted in a lot of footage. Um, and I have to shout out Leah Lalek for helping me actually organize some right. of the key scenes in this, in this film with lots of footage, like the bingo scene, um, which were some of the more challenging scenes to edit. Um, but, but yeah, I definitely don't think I truly knew what I was getting into until I had all the drives in front of me and I had, you know, 10 giant drives in my living room for a year and a half. Well, and then I kind of left you alone, right? Because I, I got another job yeah. after. And um, it wasn't until you had the entire sort of editor's cut done where we were able to release it down and, and get into it. But how did you mm -hmm. how did you juggle the tone of the film? Because it's like Gary and I wrote a film that kind of goes in a lot of different directions, but you're able to kind of corral it into a, a focus. So how did you make those decisions? before I even showed up in the edit suite? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think <laughs> I was I was most nervous. Thank you, Anna. I'm a professional moderator, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. Um, <laughs> I, I think I start I started honestly with the with some of the big scenes I was most concerned about, um, just in terms from an editing perspective. So the, you know, there's a scene where the boys are performing on a street corner and then there's like a heist happening in the background. There was a lot happening in that scene, you know, musical performance that has to be cut in an interesting way, you know, parallel to a heist and kind of like coming together. So I started with scenes that kind of stood out to me as something that would be a bit of a challenge. And I would mm -hmm. start with that and then kind of build around those. Um, yeah, and there are a lot of different kinds of like tones in the film, but I think that honestly, it was just all done really well. It was, I, you know, I love narrative editing and I think everything just kind of felt pretty natural. I, I, I like that it turned out, I think Gary and I were both like, this is funnier than we thought it was gonna be, right Gary? It was like. <laughs> yeah, like the, the way it was cut together, it really caught the tone that I think we we're looking for. I mean, we were trying to do um, a bit of the black comedy and, and and when you're writing it, and, and even when you're filming it, you're not sure that it's actually gonna carry through. And I thought Anna did a great job of, of bringing that out, like it really good. Like it was, you know, when, when I was in the suite watching you and, and would, I'd leave and go, wow, that, that, that's cool. That turned out really well. And so, yeah, I was really happy. Um, well, Oslo went to sleep, which means we can now go to Abby Fettigreen uh, and you can speak your mind without a, a, a big yeah. hearing your words. Um, so, Oslo's a <laughs> Avi, uh, you're not just a veteran producer, but uh, a, 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 such a good friend of mine. We've been looking for a project to work on together. Uh, I brought you this uh, with the expectation, with I don't know what my expectation was. And for some reason you decided to come on board. Your expertise has been in the post side and the delivery side and the distribution side of the film. Can you talk about the, the back end of the movie and how we've had to pivot uh, during COVID, uh, Gail Harvey, uh, wonderful director. Hey, Gail, asks, um, you know, do we have a marketing and distribution plan now that we're in COVID? Um, she thought that the drive-in idea was great, but can you talk about the the challenge of things I do for money uh, once the movie was done shooting? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, with films, uh, indie films in general, or films in general, I mean, the work just after you finish shooting, that's where the, you know, everybody that's only 13 days. Yeah. The, the, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, like it's, it's the work's done and you can move yeah. on, but <laughs> you know, it's, um, there's a lot of work to be done. There was a lot of, you know, there was visual effects that had to be done. 
the post audio. Once, uh, once uh, Anna and everybody picture locked the film, we had to, we worked with uh, Urban Post, the, the gang, John Lang, uh, uh, Lang Mark, and Mark yeah. Gingra, and all the, the group and gang down there to help us uh, get to the finish line. But again, even though, and that's still not the finish line because even when we finished, we were all set to go. I had uh, worked um, diligently to get us a nine city theatrical release. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, COVID happened and it blew it all up. And we were gonna premiere on uh, April 8th. So uh, we're on day 130, which means uh, Friday the 13th of March was the day I think we all went into our quarantines. It was the day, it was the day after the NBA shut down. I mean, when Forrest Gump becomes the poster child or the poster boy of COVID, um, you know that it was gonna get serious and people were going to um, have to uh, uh, alter their, li their lifestyles and, and, and the way they operated. But uh, we couldn't have saw this coming. And we, we missed our theatrical by this much. Yeah. If we only released you know, a couple months earlier, uh, we would have played in nine cities across Canada. And, you know, I mean, it's honestly, like, I'm, I still can't get over it because this is what we all, we all aspire to. We want to see our film on a big screen, which we'll see tomorrow night at a drive-in, which that in itself was a bit of stick handling to make happen. And I, you know, I'm thankful to our partners at Raven Banner who were supportive of us that, you know, we wanted to do a theatrical. We were supposed to then go digital right after a theatrical and we put the brakes on everything in, in communication with them to ask that we push our digital release um, down the road a little bit, um, which they were gracious enough to do. Uh, so that's coming up right, uh, very, very soon. August 11th. August 11th. I mean, as soon as we're, uh, basically, as soon as the credits roll tomorrow night at the drive-in theater, this whole team is in sort of August 11th promotion um, mm -hmm. mode where, you know, we're going to be coordinating some watch parties where, you know, we'll tell people when to start the movie. And then as soon as it's done, we'll do a little Q and A like this, but we can actually talk about it because those people would have seen the movie and we could give away spoilers and stuff right now. No one's really seen it except for the several hundred people at film festivals. Right. And, and film festivals, Abby are so important. But even that was cut off, right? So, yeah, so we, you know, we were, you know, we were beat up uh, like a dirty dog um, <laughs> m multiple times with this virus. So the theatrical was blown, festival opportunities blown. Um, we were lucky we gotten a sales company on board for international sales and U.S. sales before things really got nasty, and um, we we're lucky through our friends at Evolutionary. Um, films to help sell the film in the US through um, SP releasing. So they're going to be doing a physical, they're doing a physical release and a digital release and who knows some other things. Um, so all that's going on as well. And then we have some exciting news that we'll be letting everybody in on for the fall uh, down the road. Um, but it's been, you know, listen, uh, without the group of people that are sitting on this call and other people, uh, like crazy Emily Andrews is giving me the, the cross eyes. <laughs> <She's> nuts. <laughs> and our friends um, at Raven Banner. Uh, Raven Andrew, Banner, Michael, who's really, James, yeah. yeah, like, I mean, everybody over there, uh, James, Michael, uh, Andrew, uh, Anelli, everybody there, everybody's like super awesome. And is, has, with all these crazy things going on with COVID, they've just rolled with the punches and, and, and our audience who has stuck with us through all this has, and our friends and our family have stuck through all of this and listening to this, us complain and cry in their <laughs> laps about all of this. My wife deserves the purple heart for listening to my fetching about, you know, this whole thing falling apart, but yet being picked up again. And now it's the first time I've ever premiered a film at a drive-in. And, and it's sold, sold, out. sold out, yes. Sold out. Uh, well, thank you, Avi. Thank you uh, uh, to my entire production crew uh, uh, for sticking with this, the patience that we had. I'm now going to ask you to turn your cameras off. And if my amazing cast can join me, uh, we, uh, we have a little bit more time to talk. Uh, and uh, I would like to talk to my cast about making things do for money because uh, in a lot of ways, the heart and soul of the movie are, are all of you. 
Um, the Heart and Soul is the music that, uh, uh, you know, Max and Theo created. The Heart and Soul are the performances that the cast uh, made. Uh, I made a Facebook post uh, recently, and uh, this is to my, uh, my uh, four Japanese brothers in arms on this call. Things I Do for Money is the first Canadian genre film written and directed or uh, co-written and directed by a Japanese Canadian starring four Japanese uh, Canadian actors that has been sold to the United States. And in fact, it, it could very well be the first Canadian, uh, Japanese Canadian genre film of its kind ever. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Rhett, Ed, Max, and Theo, what does that mean to you? Um, I, I know, uh, maybe Rhett, you can go first because you're in the film industry. You've been a cinematographer uh, for, for decades now. What, what does that mean to be a part of something? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a dubious honor, right? Because you would think there would have been dozens by now. Yes. And actually, Warren, it's a good, good time to bring it up is the fact that I do want to ask you a question at the end of this to, yeah. to you, a question towards you being a Japanese Canadian as well. Uh, I just got to quickly say that the reason I came onto this project in the first place was that I saw Warren posting, I think it was on Facebook, saying they're looking for a Japanese actor to play the father of these kids. And yeah, I've worked 40s, in the industry- 40s. 40 something, you know, that father yeah. age, right? And I've worked in the industry for over 30 years. And I thought, I've only seen one Japanese actor in, in, in over 30 years. I don't know who you're going to find. So I literally said, Warren. And I can't afford Hiro Kanagawa. Like we, we weren't exactly. at that level, right? So. Exactly. Um, so I said, Warren, I will come and audition for you just because I really, you know, I've known you for like 12 or 14 years or something. I said, I want to help you make this film because I also know being of Japanese heritage, that it's great to have Japanese people in a film. So I said, I'll come out and audition for you, even though I've been 30 years on the other side of the camera. I've seen actors do it. I think I can maybe stumble my way through <laughs> it. And so it, this is like, uh, you said, it's a first. I mean, it was the first time I was in the film as well, but I only, because of the context of this film, began to see how little representation there had been for Japanese generally in, in the film industry. Right. Or in films. and. Yes. I think I said this after the, the experience, which is why I do more acting now than DOP work since that, since things I do for money, is that I would be, become an actor 25 years ago if I saw lots of other Japanese actors in North America that say, oh yeah, I can be like so-and-so or so-and-so. I didn't see any examples. So I actually didn't think it was even possible. Right. Uh, so uh, Ed, uh, being the other uh, sensei on this, on this Zoom, uh, what's it like uh, for you uh, in terms of, uh, oh, where'd he go? He just left. Ed, you have to turn your camera back on. Yeah, okay. I, I pushed the wrong button. What, so. are your, what are your thoughts on that? You know, it, when, when, when I heard the news, I thought that that's amazing. That's fantastic. It's kind of sad because it's the first and it's uh, 2020. But I have to say as well, Warren, that uh, when I was working on the film, I didn't think of it as a Japanese film. You weren't, you weren't, this wasn't pushed like right. this, is, this is going to be something ethnic. Right. It, it just felt like a film and it just felt yeah. like, hey, we're just doing something and it felt really good. So when I heard it, I thought, hey, that's fantastic. And also, it's not fantastic because it's so, so 2020, it's 21st century. But I have to admit that I, when, when working with you, working with everybody, it just didn't feel like we're, we're, we're promoting an, an idea ideal or, or like an ethnic agenda we just right. make something that was going to be good you know that's an important point ed it's like i think it's important um you know i'm, I'm a i'm a filmmaker and um this happens to be about a japanese family a japanese canadian family um and i i think um one of the ways subversively to have re representation on film is to start to go into spaces that might have otherwise been traditionally, you know, um, you know, maybe maybe uh, dominated by sort of the white crime filmmakers, you know, the Michael Manns, the the Coen Brothers, the you know, brilliant filmmakers, David Fincher, um, but but just give it a different just give it a different perspective. And maybe uh, Colette, you can. Uh, I, I know it's late in, in the UK, so thank you for hanging in with us. But um, you know, what was what's it like um, looking at something like Things Are Due for Money, where you get to play 
basically the criminal kingpin of an entire city. Um, you know, is that a role that you normally get? What, what's it, you know, what, what goes through your head when you- I when should be so lucky. <laughs> no, um, no, that was another reason that when I read the script, I, I just was like, yeah, no, there's nobody else gonna play. Nobody else is gonna get to play this. I need to play this part because that, that script would never, ever see the light of day here. Maybe now, maybe after Black Lives, yeah. um, because I am in such high demand at the moment that I'm actually complaining about how many, <laughs> how many self tapes I have to do. Right. Um, because I have to do them by myself. I, you know, I don't know why people send you scripts with three or four people and they call it a self tape. Right. How does that work? Right. Well, um, it, it's it's great that they're asking for you, but you know what what I what I loved about how this whole team came together is um, I don't think we went into this saying we're going to make the definitive Japanese Canadian movie. We wanted to make a good movie, right? Okay. Uh, but it, you know, in terms of um, uh, what I'm very proud of is in terms of the reputation. I mean, representation. I mean, look at this. Look at this uh, Zoom call right now. This is phenomenal, right? Like uh, we're we're all friends. We all went through a, a wonderful journey. Uh, but may, you know, maybe Yoda, you can you can tell me a little bit about um, how you feel about seeing, uh, you know, your character on screen. Uh, and and it just just tell me a little bit about your thoughts when you saw it. Yeah, like um, definitely when reading the script and just putting in work into the film, it was really great to see um, my type of character on screen in such a important role because it was like for one of the first times seeing my type of character on screen not being the token. Right. And that was really incredible to be viewed as like one of the main characters and to have a real voice was an opportunity that I don't think would have um, arose for me in this time. Well, and, and you know, um, it, it is, tokenism is a thing that you do see sometimes, it, it, not, not just in films, but in, in creative art, um, where, uh, you know, you might have a, an Asian character, or you might have a, a Black character, but they're the only ones, or they play, you know, uh, a, a, an archetype um, as, a, as a backup, but uh, both, uh, you, uh, Yoda, Laura, in the movie, you you do you you basically kind of do almost all the big narrative uh, moves within the film. And uh, when you read that in the script, did that excite you? When 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 you were able to go like, well, this is this is the important thing that's happening right now. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think being able to see myself as a main character was kind of a childhood dream and really made me want to step up to the plate and serve the best that I could do for my first time being in a film. Um, Dax and Jennifer, uh, what was it like for you, for you to kind of um, get the script, um, start working with the cast and knowing that it was, this is the slice of life that, you know, Gary and I wanted to show uh, of, of Hamilton that is not just diverse, but kind of electric and kinetic. Um, Jen, you're nodding right now, so maybe I'll ask you first. What were your thoughts? Well, I, you know, I, when I first read the script, I thought this is, it's just an incredible, amazing, action-packed story, but there's so much more there as well. And I think you really captured the grit of Hamilton. Um, I just want to say that it was such an honor to get to work with all of these actors, and it was such an honor. The first time I read the part, I thought, I feel honored as a woman of a certain age uh, to have the opportunity to have uh, a role where I feel kind of invisible these days in, in terms of uh, my age specifically right. uh, on camera and to have the opportunity to work uh, with a, like, it's a very juicy part. It, you gave me a lot to do and it was really exciting to, uh, to be a part of uh, the family, the things I do for money family. Uh, I loved how you, how you used all of the sort of landmark Hamilton locations and and captured kind of the heart and the uh, the grit of Hamilton as well. And 
you know, you, you, you bring right. up a good point. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point in terms of ageism too, right? Where, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if, if there was a role uh, that was Mary Gucci, uh, it might be, you know, uh, 10 years younger than uh, your partner that you're supposed to be with, right? So we, we were very sort of aware of that. And mm -hmm. especially Colette, I mean, that's, that's why we wrote your characters. We wanted to see you. We wanted to see... Um, the Brenda that you brought to life um, and, and show that, you know, um, uh, actors of all ages can be powerful. Um, yeah, I've been kind of doing a bit of that this year, um, changing people's perspectives on, on what they think. It's their idea of a granny. Right. The, 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 word, the, the word granny for them just means little old lady in a cardigan. Right. But you can be a or, or or a joke or or just a, the the end of a joke, right? Um, yeah. But there's yeah. so much more. Um, yeah, there is there is so much more, and 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 they're having to they're having to reassess um, mm -hmm. exactly who they cast for those parts now. Right. So uh, I'm still getting cast as a granny, and I'm still getting cast <laughs> as 18, 80 and seventy year old grannies but they don't feel that inclined to put makeup on me and make me wrinkly and old and whatever, right. um, because I might not be. Right. Uh, well, hopefully more roles like Brenda where you can really um, kick, some, kick some butt. Um, Dax and Danilo, I, I found it fascinating, uh, again, the journey that both your characters take uh, with Alexi and Gonzo, but through the lens of things I do for money, and since we're talking about representation, um, how do you interpret um, your roles in the film? Uh, maybe uh, Dinah, you can go first. And we, we, you know, Dinah, it was great. We were able to kind of talk a little bit about this uh, a couple weeks ago uh, when we were all just kind of touching base. But you know, yeah. Tell me what you're thinking, man. Well, it was, it was a great role. It was an interesting role. I liked how um, Gonzo is, although he's part of this crime family, you wouldn't necessarily think of him as an evil guy. He's actually a, kind of an intelligent, cool guy who's, who kind of wakes up in the morning and he does his job. That's why he's doing it. He, Brenda gives him a call and he has something to do and he, and he wants to do it to the best of his ability, not because he might want to hurt anyone or because um, he has that kind of evil spirit. It's just, uh, he's just kind of like a, strangely a hardworking, diligent guy and cool. And I, and, and it was, I really like in the story how there was that clash between Gonzo and and Dax and, and Alexi, because Alexi, although I also answer to Alexi, it's almost like I have to keep him in check. Versus in control, you. yeah, you have to keep him under although control. Although he's my boss. So that, that was cool. That, that added, um, um, you know, kind of a tension, um, which was humorous and serious at the same time. Uh, well, we had, we had a conversation we were putting together. I mean, we really didn't want to fall into the, the, um, the, the sort of trope of, gangsters right I mean your gonzo is so unique and um with, with even even with um uh you Ed it's like never do we mention the word yakuza right like we didn't want to fall into these uh tropes that if it's a, a black family in Hamilton they have to be the black gangsters um you're you're just a family trying to really uh um get to that next level and that was important. And even with you, Dax, um, the scene that uh, Gary and I were really uh, proud of, and, and it, both you and Danilo um, and, and Laura and Mary Houston were fantastic in it, were, was your, your home, your house scene, because we wanted to show a different side of Alexi. Um, so in terms of the lens of that, what are your feelings on Alexi Reduli? I just love the way that the film was both a, a really complex plot driven farce, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, you also have those moments of realism uh, where you see um, uh, the realness of uh, Alexi. And, um, you know, he might be a bad guy, but he also has a sensitive side. And we see that dynamic in his character as we do in a lot of the other characters in the film. So it, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised with that experience. It's not just one thing that they're going to be getting. It's a very uh, thorough experience. 
Uh, well, uh, I'm leaving the, the last two actors on this Zoom square uh, for my last question. Uh, I, I do, it, I, we can't finish this until we talk about the music. Uh, Max oh, yeah. and Theo, can you talk about um, the music of Things I Do For Money? Uh, people saw it in the trailer that started. You'll hear more of it as we release the soundtrack later on uh, this year. Uh, but uh, it's a part of the movie and it's a big part. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I think the, uh, I mean, the very first conversation we had, uh, Warren, I was with you and Gary um, at, at Gary's house, uh, putting together the idea of what's going to be sort of a, a kind of main piece. And I don't, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that we played Shell in the movie. Uh, that makes, <laughs> no, that makes it's sense. basically in every single picture every single video <laughs> we show, right? But, you're, you're not bad. I mean, you're, you guys are okay. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah. Um, and we were we were kind of saying, okay, how what kind of what kind of piece are we going to be putting here as like the the kind of title piece for the movie? And I think we we were originally talking about maybe um, of a Valdi double cello concerto, which is a very classic. Uh, any cellist would know, you know, that's the the standard. Yeah. Um, and I remember that you were telling us about, okay, here's the script, and we needed to fit, you know, five pages, which is around five minutes. And you know, it has to have this kind of level of intensity and it's gotta follow the story and it's gotta like you know it's the climax of the movie, basically. It's the it's yeah. the it's everything about the film uh coming into this five minute chunk. Right. And many, many narratives going on there. Uh and so you need a, a type of music with a lot of different narratives as well and something with that much intensity. And we And you're like, it's not fucking that <laughs> <Vivaldi." laughs> so we had to do our own thing. Right. And and I remember we were talking and kind of we we tried a whole bunch of stuff and we got into writing some cello kind of two cello pieces ourselves. That was nuts. Like we we just we just dropped everything like like three days and just like played played cello all day. And we have to put this in perspective. We we are like two months away from shooting the movie, right? And you needed it to have all this music written because you were going to perform it on screen. So you had to sync up to what the the song was going to be. You had to basically write. A virtuoso cello piece in what a week basically you know what speaking of that virtuoso cello piece too because there, there there is a like he he's the the main cellist for the the kind of certain parts of it that are mm -hmm. very very technically difficult like in the story but also you know in real life we can't play it very well <laughs> it's so hard it's so hard <laughs> And anytime, you know, we go out and we go to like, you know, festivals and, and kind of play as part of the promotion, it's very, it's very nerve wracking. Because, oh my goodness, it's tough. Oh, the most nerve wracking part. Well, Gary and I both said, write a piece actual cellists will watch and go, that's good. Oh, right. And you know what? One thing we can say for sure is that cellists will watch this and say like, that shouldn't have been written like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too tough. Like there should be other ways to do that. Right. So it was amazing. It was an incredible experience, and 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 also, you know, um, composing all of the the background music for the film too was insane. We've, we've oh, that was the, the the year after after everything is all done. We think, oh, dust settled. Time to time to kick back, relax. Oh no, Warren just sent us the email. We got to do fifty cues right now. <laughs> no, I think the entire month of the May before we finished up the mix, um, I think we had finished like three tracks, and then you sent us email saying that's great. 47 more <laughs> yes the next there's there's, oh there's my like, God. i think there's over 50 cues we we reused a couple of them but it was 50 actual new discrete music cues so yeah. for people at home uh, uh max and theo are first time uh, music scorers composers for feature films so that was something oh it was incredible it was an amazing <laughs> experience and, and kind of a little addictive too yeah. um I would like to invite uh, my crew back on camera to join uh, this wonderful cast. Um, I, uh, I, I do know that we're almost at our time. So if we can all come back, I think baby Oslo's already gone to sleep. So Laura might not join us. Christoph Benfi was using his data plan. How much is this gonna cost, Christoph? This must be like a $300 call for you. <laughs> oh, you got your mute on. Okay, um, listen. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, everybody can take their um, uh, uh, microphones off. If, if everyone just kind of wants to say a little goodbye, um, we are very, very happy to have a bit of a reunion right now. Thank you, everyone. We love you. Can't, Can't wait to see you at the drive-in. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I don't so, get to go. Oh, Colette. See you Colette. later. You'll yes, be there Colette. in spirit. See you guys we, tomorrow. 
we got it. We got to come. We got to come to the UK, Colette. We'll be there yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you to social thank you to our... my car, all of you. Social distance <laughs> my car. <laughs> thank you to our incredible community for all turning up. Like I can't believe how quickly we sold out. That's like such a it's amazing. Yeah, that's gonna be. I, awesome. I can't believe it. It's Hamilton. You know, people yeah. come out and support here. Like, just people are so excited about it. And Warren and Jen and the the whole crew. You guys did such a great job of incorporating and and getting the community involved and getting people in the Hamilton. Shout community. out to the Japanese Canadian <laughs> Center in Hamilton, uh, yeah. Japanese Cultural Center. Uh, yeah. You both are fantastic, uh, April and Chris. Uh, we shot so many scenes. Uh, at the the Japanese Cultural Center there, um, so many um, places in Hamilton. People are going to see tomorrow night. Uh, we can't wait. Um, I'm knocking on wood for the weather gods to be on our side. That it has been up to now. So um, after that, August 11th, everybody. Yeah. Uh, uh my cast and crew look for an email because we're going to be setting up um, some watch parties where we're, we won't have all of us like this uh this, this is kind of a a one-time deal only because it is it's tough with all our schedules i know um uh colette uh I, it must be eight o'clock it's five four o'clock in the morning right now for you uh, <laughs> oh but um we will we will uh do some watch parties uh when we release uh, august 11th and later on that week but until then, let's do a little picture of everybody while we have uh, while we have everybody here. All right, this is things I do for money. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Love, love Bye. to everybody. Fantastic. All right, and we will see you uh, at the movies. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah, you guys. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. We'll talk soon. Houston Ground Control, you can go back to the ground. <laughs>